Thank you for watching this presentation, which is part of the Australian Lonigan Workshop for 2021. I'll be talking about Lonigan and the encounter with Australian Indigenous culture. In this presentation, I'll use the work of Lonigan not to analyse the issue at hand in great depth, but instead to unlock it. That is, by considering Lonigan's work on classicism and historical consciousness, I'll argue that we find pivotal and fruitful insights that unleash a series of other insights. My basic thesis for this presentation is that Australian Aboriginal economy can inform, augment and vindicate Catholic social teaching on work, technology and leisure. Australian Aboriginals represent the world's oldest civilization. They were the first people to sail beyond sight of land. They managed the land through fire technology so as to create what has been called the biggest estate on earth. And they discovered aerodynamics over 20,000 years ago. But in days past, Catholicism has been unable to learn from Aboriginal culture. This is because of a monoculturalist viewpoint that confuses the universal cultural values of all humans with the myriad cultures that express and nurture the values of that universal culture. Bernard Lonigan describes the ideology of classicism, that is the viewpoint that identifies the universal culture of humanity with classical European culture. This ideology meant that instead of conceiving classical culture as one high point in culture, it was believed to be the only way of expressing the culture of humanity. A classicist mindset cannot communicate with Aboriginal culture. It can only impose its own categorical knowledge and values on Aboriginal people. This means two things. First, Catholicism found it hard to translate itself into terms intelligible within Aboriginal culture. Secondly, it meant that it was hard for Catholics to learn from Aboriginal people who were assumed to be culturally inferior. The answer to classicism is found within Lonigan's scholarship. Historical and cultural consciousness does not treat culture normatively but empirically. An empirical conception of culture holds that cultures can be manifold, they can develop and decline, grasp new meanings and accept new values, give to and receive from other cultures. And the element of receiving from other cultures is very important for this presentation. Lonergan proposed that to avoid classicism, we need to be sufficiently removed from the contingencies of current issues. That is, among other things, one needs to acknowledge the limits of one's own culture and time and find a foundation and a methodology that are beyond the contingencies of academic discourse at any one time or in any one culture. The Second Vatican Council reinforces the points made by Lonergan. It states clearly in Gaudium et Spes that the Church is not bound exclusively to any race or nation. That is, it sees the church as reaching out to multiple cultures, and it means not only serving those cultures, but also seeing the wider church being enriched by those cultures. In Ad Gentes, Vatican II taught that Catholic missionaries were not only to engage the people to whom they're reaching out, but also to identify with the people. That is, Catholic mission was reconceived not just to bring the message of Christ to people, but through, and I quote, sincere and patient dialogue with that culture to discover the richness of that culture. They were taught to use Christian faith, not to crush other cultures, but instead to set them free, to protect and nourish those cultures. Now, having said that, how can we reconcile those affirmations with something John Paul II said in Ex Corde Ecclesiae, that there is only one culture, that of man, by man, and for man. Was John Paul II a classicist? 
we see some clarification also in Ex Corde Ecclesiae, when John Paul writes not of the church imposing cultures on people, but of Catholic universities in particular, engaging in a fertile dialogue with people of every culture. That is, he sees the, the mission of Catholic universities as contributing to the life and well-being of people within the culture in which they live. What John Paul is driving at is that there is one universal, what I might call, capital C culture of humanity, but that this universal culture is expressed in multiple small c cultures. In addition, John Paul argues that through enculturation, the church makes the gospel incarnate in different cultures and at the same time introduces people together with their cultures into her own community. Please note what the Pope says, people are brought together with their cultures into the church. What the Pope is saying is that mission is a two-way street, with the church willing to learn and appropriate the good things that come from other cultures. This point resonates with Vatican II's Agentes, which encouraged missionaries to engage the world's people and to learn from them through patient dialogue. The Council said that we can learn what treasures a generous God has distributed among the nations of the earth. Together, Vatican II and John Paul make it clear that the Universal Church can learn lessons from the world's different cultures. That is, in encounters with cultures, the Church doesn't only speak, but it listens. In addition, in his Alice Springs Address, John Paul II affirmed the value and dignity of Aboriginal culture. He referred to the genius and dignity specifically of Aboriginal culture and declared, quoting Pope Paul VI, that the Church doesn't want Aboriginal people to renounce their culture. Instead, it is a culture that must not be allowed to disappear. In a clear rejection of classicism or monoculturalist ideology, John Paul said, and I quote, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ speaks all languages. It esteems and embraces all cultures. So what we find by reference to Lonigan, John Paul II and Vatican II is the radical viewpoint that not only should Catholicism be translated into other cultures, but that other cultures can teach Catholicism valuable lessons. So if we go beyond translating the Catholic message into Aboriginal culture, what lessons can we learn from Aboriginal culture? I'll mention several very briefly, then explore Aboriginal economy in a bit more detail. On moral foundations, John Paul II declared that Catholic moral theology had become decadent, legalistic, and paid too little attention to the human person experienced from within. From the Yaru people of the Kimberley, we learn of a moral code of Lian Nian. It's best translated into English as the setting right of the spirit. Lian Nian means that what lies at the heart of morality is neither reward nor punishment, nor a consideration of whom one hurts or benefits, nor does it represent a set of le legislative rules. Rather, morality is about a coming together of the spirit, a setting right of the person's spirit. So what may strike a Catholic theologian about Lian Yan is that as a way of life, it resonates closely with the renewal of morality that Pope John Paul II was striving for, especially is in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor. On education, John Paul II complained in Ex Corde Ecclesiae that education in recent decades has become plagued by a rigid compartmentalization of knowledge. John Paul II instead argued that a Catholic university should stand for an integration of knowledge and a living union of knowledge under the mantle of wisdom. Again, Aboriginal wisdom can teach us lessons here. In a conversation with Professor, now Senator Patrick Dodson, I learned that the Aboriginal way 
is to integrate knowledge, law and tradition under a tradition of wisdom. In other words, what we're seeking for in education today is something that has been known to Aboriginal people for tens of thousands of years. The last brief lesson concerns family relations. There is an Aboriginal prohibition against speaking directly to your mother-in-law or father-in-law. If you want to speak to your in-laws, you have to go through an intermediary, usually your spouse. Now I believe that part of Aboriginal law is the reason they've survived 40,000 years and frankly holds the key to resolving a lot of conflicts today, personal, national and international. There's a lot we can learn from Aboriginal law. I'd like to turn now to Aboriginal economy and the use of new technology. I'll be drawing on the archaeological work of Eugene Stockton and Rhys Jones. In his study of developing technology, that is better stone tools, hunting weapons and so on, Jones put the point this way, improved technology results in increased extractive efficiency. That results in one of three things, more food, different food or more time. Jones's research in Tasmania showed no evidence to suggest that better technology went into extracting more food. As for different foods, the archaeological evidence is that it was the environment rather than technology that drove the adoption of new foods. Instead, as Jones points out, the evidence is that technological development and technological efficiency led to more time being available for people. Stockton's research in the Blue Mountains and the Pean region similarly showed that changes in stone tool technology meant more time, more leisure time at base camp. He showed that Aboriginal economy valued human culture over the accumulation of material goods. He argues that new technologies have been used by Aboriginal people not to increase material wealth but to augment the time available for liberal activities and to enhance the liberal culture of Aboriginal people. Those liberal activities include things like leisure, religious ritual, education, display of skill or art, sport and play, close relationships, interpersonal communication and other things that make for quality of life. In that light, it's interesting to consider that in Aboriginal culture, new technology was not devoted to materialism or consumerism, but the liberalisation or the culturing of the human person. Stockton argues that over tens of thousands of years, Aboriginal society evolved into a delicate balance with its environment. Technological changes were not viewed as something that provided greater productivity, but instead as providing more time for the really self-enriching activities. As Jones puts it, they invested the advantages of new tools into the realms of the ego, the mind and the soul. This is all in stark contrast to Western culture in which new technology tends to be used to increase wealth, possessions, goods and services. Aboriginal economy then has a lesson for all of us, especially with regard to Catholic social teaching. Jesus Christ challenged those who made an idol of the law by declaring that the Sabbath was made for human beings, not human beings for the Sabbath. Catholic social teaching today seeks a way of declaring that work and the economy is for human beings, not human beings for work. The compendium of the social doctrine of the church warns us against the temptation of making an idol of work. It also notes that Jesus teaches us not to be enslaved by work because before all else, we have to be concerned about our soul because gaining the whole world is not the object of our life. Those concerns are echoed by John Paul II, who argued that ethical concerns, the good of the human person, should always have priority over technical realities. That is, persons are more important than material objects. Technology may be useful for making objects, but it is better if it serves human persons as subjects. 
I might also relate Aboriginal economy and use of technology to the 1930 essay by John Maynard Keynes. He predicted that developments in technology would allow people to meet their needs with only a 15 hour work week. That correlates with Stockton's discovery that Aboriginal hunter-gatherers only required two to four hours of subsistence activity a day. The rest of the day was taken up with liberal activities, art, talk, religion, and so on. There was also a limit on subsistence activity that protected the environment from over-exploitation and exhaustion of resources. So why is it that we work more than the 15 hours a week predicted by Keynes. I'd argue that the wants and perceived needs of today are more than the 1930s. It's clear that with modern technology, we could easily sustain a 1930s level of comfort with Keynes's 15 hour work week, but we could not sustain ourselves if we were addicted to a 2021 level of prosperity. It seems that in our culture, as our productive efficiency has increased, our desire for material goods and services has also risen dramatically. At the same time, Joseph Piper argues that Western society has forgotten the value of leisure and given privilege to material gain and the accumulation of possessions. Piper argues that leisure properly conceived was one of the foundations of Western culture as Aristotle notes in the Metaphysics, creative leisure is what gave rise to the arts and sciences that gave meaning and value to our society. However, John Paul II finds that contemporary trends of materialism conceptualize human beings as simply an instrument of production that contradicts church teaching that we are both the maker and subject of our work. So in this context, John Paul II rejects propositions that we should live to work. He teaches instead that work serves a spiritual end rather than serving as an end in itself. And John Paul II importantly affirms that rest is more than simply not working. It is a recreative activity, or I would say a liberal activity in the sense that people are liberated from work to pursue higher activities. So between Piper and Catholic teaching, we are left with the question, should advanced technology be used for more wealth, more goods and more services, or should technological innovations lead to more time spent on liberal activities as per Aboriginal culture? I don't have time to go into this in great detail, but Stockton makes a helpful comparison between Western and Aboriginal economies. He observes that Western society began with a struggle within its natural environment, and that turned to an attempt to dominate the environment, to manipulate and exploit the environment to fulfill wants and needs. Then, when the environment was exhausted, new environments would be sought out and similarly exploited. Stockton observes that this way of living precipitated conflicts not just with the environment but between societies and it led to competition between individual people. Now that point is borne out by the work of Malthus in his essay on population and Darwin in The Origin of Species in which the natural order of human beings and nature itself is seen in terms of exploitation, shortage and lethal competition all of which lead to what's been called the survival of the fittest. This view of the economy and natural order, at its worst, has led to human relationships being based on greed, dishonesty, people having their personal value defined by their work, and utilitarian production being valued over service to the community. It leads to wastefulness of resources, environmental exploitation, and competitive conflict in all ways of life. Instead of that path, Stockton says that Aboriginal Australians took another way. Instead of exploiting the land, they became its custodians. Instead of a materialist economic relationship with the land as a commodity, Aboriginal people became partners with the land in a way of life 
that became a spirituality. I might make an important clarification here. The question of Aboriginal economy is not just a matter of primitive versus advanced technologies. As Jones points out, Aboriginal women with digging sticks are more efficient at hunting rabbits than men with telescopic sighted rifles. And Aboriginal fist traps were so much better than poles, lines and hooks that they have been banned. Sometimes Aboriginal technology is better. But the, the essential insight here is that for Aboriginal people, what matters is not the technology, but the way it's used and the purpose for which it's used. Is it to create wealth, gather more material possessions to exploit and degrade the environment? Or is the technology meant for the good of the human person and the advancement of liberal culture? If we join Lonigan in rejecting classicism and embracing historical consciousness, we can understand and learn from Aboriginal culture. Catholic social teaching calls for human values in which the economy serves humanity rather than the other way around. It calls for material possessions to be subject to the human good. It calls for a reduction in conflict and peace between people. Aboriginal economy shows a proven way in which these objectives are possible and in fact have persisted for millennia. Aboriginal culture, in partnership with Catholic social teaching, has a valuable lesson to teach Western society. Instead of using new technologies to sustain a never satisfied craving for more goods and services, Aboriginal culture utilised technology in the service of leisure and the liberal activities that make a person more cultured and more civilised. This simple but powerful contrast between economic visions means that Aboriginal culture can offer a solution to some pressing social concerns facing Western society. That is, by prioritising the liberal and the cultural over the material, Aboriginal people provide a valuable les lesson in leisure, a lesson that's been forgotten by a technology-obsessed society and a lesson that can be retaught and augmented by Aboriginal people's way of life. I'd emphasise, I am not advocating, nor does Aboriginal economy advocate, a rejection of technology. It is not the level of technology that is the issue, but the way technology is used and the human values that, that technology either supports or hinders. If we make the human choice advocated in Catholic social teaching and Aboriginal economy, then technology should not dominate humanity, but serve human cultural values. The research I've spoken about shows that Aboriginal economy and the culture it produced informs, augments, and validates key elements of Catholic social teaching on work, technology, and leisure, and shows how it could be applied successfully to advance human values. I'm also reminded of a comment made by the late Professor Peter Burley, Professor of Econometrics at La Trobe University. He once remarked that capitalism and communism were the same thing. The difference is that in the first, the resources are held by a few. In the other, the resources are held by one. The reality is that both are materialistic in their orientation. But above and beyond capitalism and communism, Aboriginal economics shows a third way beyond materialism to an economy and a culture in which the human person is paramount. It's an economic outlook that not only has an affinity for Catholic social teaching, it teaches us valuable lessons and provides evidence of how key elements of Catholic social teaching can work in real life. And so it's with some irony I consider the quote from Pope Leo XIII that's cited so often by Lonigan so favourably, Vetera novus augere et perficere, to augment and perfect the old with the new. The irony is that in this case, instead of augmenting the old with the new, 
we have an opportunity here to augment the old with the even older, that is to highlight lessons for Catholicism from Australian Aboriginal culture. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye and God bless.